Hello, everybody. First of all, good afternoon in Singapore and the rest of Asia, I guess. Uh, and good morning in Europe. I'm saying good morning, Europe, because today our guests do come from Germany. Um, thank you and welcome to another ADN event series, 2021-2022. Uh, and for today, we have Ming Pun and Tan Tan Liu, who's joining us with Fiza Masnan, who's going to be talking about translocal connections, introducing the Asian Performing Arts Lab, uh, which is based in Germany slash Berlin. Before we go into that, I'm just going to do a quick introduction. My name is Hao Nian. I'm the co-director of the Asian Dramaturgs Network, uh, ADN for short. ADN was formed with the intent of mapping and networking the region's dramaturgical experience and knowledge. ADN has been in collaboration with Centre 42 Singapore and held its inaugural symposium in Singapore in 2016. Since then, there has been various gatherings of dramaturgs, performance makers and arts educators from around the Asia Pacific region uh, taking place in Japan, Australia, Indonesia. We have had many different forms of uh, discussions uh, from conferences to symposiums to roundtables and little panels. And uh, we've even had a successful dramaturgy workshop in Yogyakarta in Indonesia. Um, Centre 42 Singapore, I'm very happy to say, is a principal organising partner for ADN for which um, these events will not happen without the administrative and management uh, capabilities of Center 42. Right, on to today's uh, topic, Translocal Connections, Introducing the Asian Performing Arts Lab in Germany, APEL for short. Is that how we pronounce it, Ming? <laughs> APEL, is that how you guys pronounce it? Great. Um, I'm just gonna give you a bit of preamble. While the world has been isolating and going online, uh, especially the arts world and grappling with technology and digital technology, uh, there have been still emergent, but small communities, and obviously with very safe measures put in place, that are coming together in the process of making art. These initiatives strive for development and works in progress with support from a collective of artists. Uh, there are many of these sorts of examples actually, not just happening uh, today we're talking about one that is in Europe, but if you do a search, a Google search, you will find that there are actually many of these types of little initiatives, whether it's residencies, networks of smaller groups of artists coming together uh, in persons, actually, and in a more local way, because they do not have the largest and the kind of uh, freedom to travel, right? Uh, I'm talking about, especially in places like Indonesia, where there has been very successful artistic initiatives that are very locally driven. Uh, in the city of Bandung, in the city of Jakarta, for instance, they are already very active. They have been active for a long time. In Japan, there have been many little ones in smaller cities like Niigata, uh, Fukuoka, uh, in Kobe, where they have actually developed and progressed even further with their local community of artists. But today we're here to talk about a very special one uh, called APEL. And this, uh, I'm also still trying to understand it where I've had a very fruitful two hour conversation with Ming, founder of this particular lab, where it talks about having an aim of providing what he calls a safe holding place for artists to spend time uh, developing and trialing artistic ideas. What is also very special about APEL is that on top of offering what I would call a uniquely short residency, whom I'm sure they will tell you more about it, it also aligns itself with feminist, queer, uh, decolonial, and trans-local perspectives and approaches. And today we'll be hearing a little bit about these ideas of translocalism also from uh, two of them from APEL. So in this particular forum, we will be uh, talking to founder Ming Pun and dramaturg Tan Tan Liu, who comes to us both from Germany. Although Ming is Singapore born, 
and Tan Tan is from Beijing, I understand. Joining us will be provocateur slash discussant Fiza Masnan. Ming works with applied choreography, using it as a tool to interrogate, disrupt, and reorganize the social and political relationality of the body in time and space. In particular, he is interested in the potential within the body of the weak or the peripheral, as he calls it, to resist and disrupt hegemonic structures by using choreographic strategies that involve decolonization, vulnerability, care, queerness, and failure. For him, movement refers to the body's ability not to just move, but to take action and have agency to create change. His works as he sees his works as choreographic interventions and social experiments, which are interactive and collaborative in design. His practice has been inspired by Buddhist concepts of interdependence and care, Butler's resistance and vulnerability, Haberstam's queer art of failure, Bawal's theater of the oppressed, and Buryot's micro utopias. So it's rather far reaching. And at the same time, there is an interconnectivity. If you look at all these people, right, from Butler to Boa, Haberstam, Borio, there is the stress actually on the marginal, if nothing else. Yeah. Uh, so he initiated APEL in 2020 as a platform for artists with Asian backgrounds to meet, share, work together, and is also a founding member of Urgent Bodies, which I'm sure he can tell us a bit more. He also manages uh, the farm and independent space that combines performance making with activism and co-living. On to Tan Dan, uh, born in Beijing. She is a theatre maker and dramaturg, member of the Berlin Ring Theatre Collective. She moved to Germany at the age of 23 to study theatre studies at the Free University of Berlin. So there's again a little bit of a uh, pedigree there, where the Free University has always been quite a champion of performance studies. Uh, characterized by her transcultural perspectives and interdisciplinary approaches, Tantan's works focus on the areas of participatory theatre, political theatre and dance theatre. Besides collaborating with numerous young artists as drama Turk, she also works with the established artists including Kadir Amigo Memis, Yui Kawaguchi, Ming of course, and Naoko Tanaka. She has, her works have been shown on different stages, such as with Berlin Ring Theatre, with the Hebel Am Ufer Berlin, Theatre House G7 Mannerheim, Tanz House, NRW Dusseldorf, just to name a few. And then last but not least is Fiza, who comes to us as a creative producer and performance dramaturg based in Singapore. Her creative vision centers on the contemporization of traditional art forms, development of new artistic languages and growing of audience around the artists whom she works for. I would rather say that it's artists that she works with. Her experience is diverse and international. She has managed and produced shows of varied formats, both locally and internationally, and has pro programmed and led cutting edge commission works in both art centered international festivals and she has also conceptualized and produced platforms for the development of emerging choreographers and artists, uh, directors uh, in minority groups, cultural groups in Singapore. Uh, Fiza's networks especially span across Asia Pacific, Middle East, Europe, and the Americas. Again, thank you all for the three of you for joining us today and welcome to the session. Uh, I will now quickly hand the mic over to Tan Tan and Ming who will tell us a bit more about APEL and uh, where it is now, where it has been before, and of course the underlying philosophy of translocalism that we uh, that I'm actually quite taken with. So they will present all that, and then this will be about 25 minutes, and then after that, Fiza will join in the conversation to give us a little bit of her reflective critical feedback on what she's been listening to, and perhaps also then make links to her own works, yeah? and her own uh, experiences in producing for minority uh, communities. So over to you, Tan Tan and Ming. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Hao Nian, for the wonderful introduction. Um, Dan, da, Dana, should I start or would you want to start? Um, I think you could start. 
Okay, then uh, let me begin. So um, just um, back to the idea of uh, talk, working with, uh, like how near I say, I work with the vulnerable or the weak or the peripheral, but also with the social actually. So all the um, authors or uh, things that person have been inspired uh, by are people working the social aspect of art as well. So um, this, this is the combination I work with a lot. So APAL arise, uh, arise out of that, um, that condition, uh, the, 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 the peripheral and also the, uh, the social aspect. So uh, let's me explain how we started or how I started it. In 2019, uh, I was in a, another conference and we were talking about how, uh, at least uh, in the group, I realized we we're talking about making spaces and I realized how in Berlin, there was not a platform, a space for Asian artists. There were a lot of, there were a few spaces in Berlin at the moment or at that time for uh, black artists, for South American artists, uh, but the Asian artists, uh, we, we, we had a lack, there was a gap. So it was basically this gap that prompted the first uh, thought of starting a space or a pl platform for Asian artists. And at that time, most Asian artists were working separately, even today, uh, they are working separately, uh, they are very isolated. So there's a kind of not, not um, there, there wasn't a chance to share and combine effort or come together to find solidarity. Uh, and this particularly was important because at, at that time, there was an incident that happened in the German theater, uh, where a play what, that was based on a Vietnamese, German Vietnamese story is about uh, immigration from a Vietnamese family, but the whole play was um, casted with white German actors. So for many of the Vietnamese actors or performers here, or also Asian artists here, they were kind of um, outraged because there was, it seems like there was this kind of uh, tokenism happening or uh, exploitation happening uh, using stories of another culture but yet having no representation inside. So, uh, and they started forming, artists started coming together and say, you know, we don't agree with that. And that was also one of the reasons it fueled uh, the impulse for uh, APAL. We were thinking, at least I was thinking how we could um, uh, form together a group where we don't have to depend on other people to give us a chance to have representation. What about we? doing our own representation. So I uh, spoke to my collaborator and also uh, uh, my colleague, uh, Federica Tsai, and I said, let's start something. Let's do a, a lab, you know, like create a kind of a workshop, get artists together, get a, a whole platform where they come together, they work together and create a kind of a solidarity, you know, other than making work, but also forming a kind of bonding and a kind of a group where we can speak and we can, uh, yeah, um, exchange, but also at the same time, uh, form comrade sheet or bond, bonding with one another. So this was how it started. 2019, we spoke about it. We met uh, Dana as well, actually, um, to discuss the pos uh, possibility of doing this uh, platform and having Berliner Ring Theatre to host it or as a co-productions partner. And, uh, but then we wanted to start in 2020, April, then the pandemic came, so we had to shift it. So our first edition appeared in 2020, uh, October. The first two edition we had uh, was without funding, everything was self-organized, uh, and it was supported by many different players. Uh, one of them obviously uh, is uh, Dana and um, Berliner Ring Theatre. And um, now we have the fourth edition coming. Uh, in fact, today is the deadline for the application sending, and we would have it in April 2028th uh, of April. Yeah. And with that, I want to pass to Dana to talk a little bit about uh, the partnership with us as a dramaturg, but also as a, as a member of the Berliner Ring Theater. Thank you, Ming. Thank you for the introduction. And hello, everyone. I'm going, I think I'm going to today represent a little bit of the perspectives of Berliner Ring Theater. Berliner Ring Theater is a venue for newcoming uh, theater makers, especially actually for spoken theater. And the Ring Theater is run by a collective, which means that we don't have an artistic direction. The artistic direction um, is a, a collective of about 10 to 12 persons. And a person, and um, at that time, at that time that we um, 
get uh, we got the proposal from APO. Uh, I think we have um, nine members who are white, three members who are BPOC, and at that time, I was the only collective member who do not grow up in Germany. And at the first time, we got the proposal from Ape, which was sent by Federica uh, Tsai, who is also today in the in the audience. I, I saw her name. Um, actually, she do not know that the Ring Theatre have an Asian collective member, I think. And the first topic we discussed in our panel, is in our um, panel um, in this, our collective, is that um, what does it mean, Asian artist? Because Asian is not uh, identity. Asian is not a political or cultural identity. Asian is very heterogeneous. And also the Asian countries have uh, has a very different traditions, has very different political contexts, and there are actually barely political concerns between like different Asian countries. And also we are very also very interested like how would be the difference between the BPOC artists who are growing, growing up in Germany and the, the art migrants, the first generation art migrants who like I and me and Federica come to Germany after that we um, finished one education or like have some life experience in, a, in, a, in, our, in another countries. And um, why are April going to labor all this kind of so heterog heterogeneous groups of the artists and what would it mean in a political way? And um, we are we have some doubts, but we are very interested also in this idea to create this kind of Asian solidarities, which is actually not existed, I will say, in a in a beyond the Berlin artist scene. And, and also um, one reason we also discussed uh, because Ring Theater, um, the, the the most of the, our, our members are white, we also discussed are we tokenized April? <laughs> for our own uh, diversity politics and how are we going to make a difference between tokenism and non-tokenism. So that's why also very important for us, for Ring Theater, that APO has, has run by themselves. They have their autonomy. We don't take part in the choose of the art projects which are showing by us. And also we don't interfere, um, which means that uh, we hope, Ring Theater hope that we only share the resource and space with the APO, but still the like um, like Ming and Federica write in their in the, in the, in the, in the proposal that um, in April that the artists could do all the aesthetics and topics what they are want. Yes, I'm finished, I think, from my side. So maybe let me explain also how APAL the design works, right? Uh, since Dana touched on that, APAL uh, is a short residency. It's a, we call it a rice cooker, you know, a kind of steam cooker, <laughs> steam cooker <laughs> compressed. It started uh, the first two edition, not funded editions. We did five uh, days. It was a five days residency. Um, artists come for the first four days, and then the last day they go, they will go to um, do the presentation. And now that it's funded, we extend it to seven days because uh, then we could give the artists a bit of money, and with that we hope that it will kind of cover their period of stay at the, on the farm. So. Uh, let me explain where the farm is. The farm is 19 minutes away from Berlin. It's in the countryside, totally isolated uh, in nature. And Berlin, uh, obviously, is a city, uh, vibrant, a lot of artists, a lot of things happening. Now, um, what, what they do is they come to the farm for six days. They are kind of uh, immersed in the experience of being with one another. And they don't know each other. Uh, none of them, usually most of them don't know each other. Maybe one or two do know a each other by crossing path uh, somewhere but usually they are working isolated like i said before most asian artists in germany work isolated and um and on the farm we have very basic stuff which means we ask the artists to work with the very basic um on the very basic level of <clears throat> light and sound <clears throat> let me explain later on why that was so it's part of the <clears throat> excuse me part of the concept we have for apel as well um APEL work on two levels. It's one on the one level is the artistic level, and on the other side is a social level. So on the artistic level, uh, it is important that the artists um, 
uh, work on, like I say, on a very basic level, on the technical stuff. We ask them to really concentrate on their craft uh, rather than co concentrate on the, 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 the I would say, oh, for, for better or worse word, the decoration. <laughs> you know, we're not looking for, example, we're not looking for end products. We tell them to go for the work in progress, experimentation, research. Uh, so they usually apply with, uh, with an idea that they want to work on or they would like to rework a draft or they want to experiment an idea that they want to find a new direction. This is what you, we, we ask the artist to come in the residency with. So they are not expected to produce any end product and we explicitly tell them we do not need or want end products. So it's explicit uh, uh, even in the open calls. So they know it. And uh, usually we, we choose five artists and sometimes it can be in a group, but they are all Asians and none of them, there cannot, there cannot be a mix of uh, non-Asians inside, uh, partly because we have in our experience um, when they are, um, the, the response from our artists from last editions was that having just a purely Asian, which is obviously a very broad uh, definition, allows a certain space for dialogue and openness and kind of it releases them from this having to, um, how do I say, when they live in a white society, we are living in Germany, sometimes they have to excuse themselves, explain themselves a lot. And it, in the community where they don't have this other person, a non-white uh, person in the, in the group, it allows them to speak about things and share about experiences which without having to explain. Everyone somehow understand it. For example, racism. <laughs> it's so simple to, to just talk about it and not having to excuse themselves or explain themselves. And that gives them a kind of freedom, let them sink into the, the, the group and the working. And that allows them to also create work, we, meaning we ask them to go for their voice, be fearless, say things without having to explain. So that allows them to just bring up topics which they normally would have to reframe it for the white society so that allows them to go like directly into the topic and Ming, so can i just quickly uh interject here uh it would be interesting if you can tell us also in the past uh few residencies uh where are your artists from or originally or their birthplace right because you've been yes. talking a lot about the diversity of asian artists coming to apel Yes, so the artists are from a range of Asian countries, but they're also, some of them are first generation uh, Germans, which means they are German, Vietnamese, German, uh, Koreans, German, Chinese. They are mixed uh, uh, French, uh, Japanese. So I'm just thinking off my head who they are. Um, and they are from different countries of origin, like Japan, uh, Korea, uh, Malaysia, even, <laughs> hello, and uh, India, USA as well. So they are not also, it's a diverse range. And obviously, like Dana said, this idea of Asian is a very, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very broad definition. And even we, me and Federica, we are aware from the very beginning, what is Asia? Which, how, do we, how do we define Asian? You know, it's, it's, it's an identity which is very broad, very horrors and also very problematic as well if you want to see that way but we also think it's interesting to bring it up you know like just talk about it it is problematic you know um so yes yeah, so the range is wide and they are not all uh they come from different backgrounds and language obviously are they are different maybe i will explain why this is important uh when we talk about translocality but just this is to let you know that we have a wide range and back to the topic of how they work artistically, we require that we told them to go to the core of their work, but also to go to the core of their voice. So having this Asian-ness inside the group, it allows them to say, let's say something, and they support one another's voice. Because within this group, they, they work together, they help each other as an uh, outside eye, or they give feedback, go stronger on this voice. So they encourage each other to, to work on that voice. And so it's very important to have this very, uh, I would say cohesive group, but a, a group that allows that, that voice to appear. And like Dana say, they, Berlin Ring Theatre does not in, interfere in our selection of the artists. We ourselves as organizers, me and Federica and uh, Jing Yun, who is also our coordinator and communicator officer, uh, we do not interfere with the artist's choice or uh, working process. We do not enter into their rehearsal space. They actually work on their own. We do not do any... Uh, 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 
yeah, we do not look any uh, advice or anything unless they ask us specifically to enter into the space. We do not do any of that. The artists work out among themselves. They support each other. They themselves help each other. Um, we also encourage them to use this presentation at the end, not as a performance, but as a first uh, contact with the public to see, to get feedback, to see if they need to rework it or to see how the work can be reframed or rework uh, on. So this is what we encourage the artists to do and also to tell them, you know, coming back to this idea of finding their inner voice. Uh, it was very clear from the beginning, I told uh, most of the time the artists that uh, even if you fail, it's okay because it's the first time you are making the attempt. Uh, just go for the extreme, go for the challenging part uh, rather than trying to be safe and please anyone. You don't, you don't have to please us. We don't have to please the organizers. They, you just have to please yourself. And so we also encourage them not to be afraid of, or, or at least we tell them you do not need to succeed for us. <laughs> you can do whatever you want. So that's, that's, that's the space they work in. This is the artistic level, right? And on the... Um, uh, and Dana actually comes in the artistic level. She comes in as a dramaturg. She comes in as a kind of a little, what we call the booster. You know, she comes in and just on the fourth day of the residency, she comes in to give a little, uh, I would say, advice or a little feedback. That's all. And they have, she has only one hour with each person. So it's a very short feedback. Dana. Uh, perhaps I could also here very in, uh, introduce very briefly how I'm, I'm uh, usually going to give this feedback. And as a drama church, I have one like principle, uh, principle, 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 principle. Yes, uh, how I'm going to do advice um, as code. I call it empowerment advice, which means like I don't give them my judgment about if their art is good or bad. I try to help them to find out their own interest their own especially artistic interest on the topic because as my according to my experience most young artists also um bpoc artists they have a lot of message what they want to want to see want to want to talk about want to say what they have, they want to explain a lot of things like explain um their life situations explain racism also explain the culture differences um, but I think it's a very good starting point, but still they want they need to develop their own artistic methods. And what I can do in this very short time, one hour, is trying to find out which are their own interests actually on the on the topic, uh, why they are why they want to do it uh, through an artistic way. And then I'm usually I'm going to strengths and also I'm going to like um conform them in their own artistic interests and helping them like to develop this artistic artistic part further. Yes. And also I, I must I must mention as, as uh, according to my experience, it would be quite problematically if I represent Green Theatre and I'm white to doing this kind of job. Then otherwise it's like what happened all the time in, in Germany like the, the BPOC artists present their work and then as were judged by a white institutions. And so it's actually quite, <laughs> it's, uh, quite lucky that um, Ring Theater could do it like this way. Yeah, I'm um, finished. I, yeah, great. Thank you, Dan Dan. Uh, I just want to, at this point, maybe flag up, maybe it's me being a bit sensitive about uh, what we know, what we don't know. And... Um, I just want to say that uh, is that uh, I or rather I want to just flag up this uh, this term that we've been using uh, BPOC. I'm not sure whether we are we do use it in in Asia proper. Actually, I have to admit that I've only come across that word since moving to Australia and uh, working in the artistic terrain in Australia. So uh, forgive me if I feel sound patronizing, but for those who are for the uninitiated, uninitiated uh, uh, BPOC was a term that was uh, coined uh, to sort of uh, represent uh, non-white communities, and it stands for Black and people of color, right? So that, uh, especially when we deal with uh, arts and culture in the West, that has become almost like a default term when we talk about non-Caucasian artistic or cultural communities, and even aesthetics, actually. Uh, 
sorry, that's that's all I want to say. Please go on. Thank sorry, you. it's Black, Indigenous, and people of color. That's right, BIPOC. BIPOC. And um, so also what uh, to add on to what Dana said, um, most artists coming into uh, APAL, um, because of we give them such a big space, they do have, they become, it becomes very challenging. This is the first time they can do whatever they want without having to second guess what would be approved by the institutions, right, which are usually white. So would it be uh, would it be a, a be read differently if it's uh, read by a white? But here for us, it's like you read whatever you want. We are uh, we don't need that. And so sometimes it's quite uh, harrowing to say, "Oh, I can do what I want. <laughs> what do I want now?" And then that becomes a, the first time they have to think, "What do I really want to say?" <laughs> so most of the time, for like seven days, the first three days, people are just trying to figure out if I get this chance to say what I want to say, how do I say? It? So the first three days actually sp they are spent on thinking what they want to say. And then when Dana comes in to give a little push, they're like, <gasps> and then they sort of re sculpt it again. So this is a very interesting, so it's a very intense process for the artist because the space is so wide and therefore they, and the, and the time is very short, seven days. And the presentation, by the way, we tell them to limit it to 12 minutes, which means I tell them, we tell them, go to the core of your work. Don't go to, for the fluff, you know, <laughs> go to the core of what you want to say in the 12 minutes. And that 12 minutes is maximum. They can do three minutes. They can do six minutes. Uh, so again, very broad, very uh, free. They do, it's not like 12 minutes. It's, uh, they must do 12 minutes. It can be shorter, actually. The 12 minutes is also because of the fact that we want to care for the last presenter. Like, you know, if you have too long, then the audience get tired. We tell them we care for one another. So we make sure that the, the presentation doesn't extend beyond one hour or more because then your, the last uh, artist would have a very tired audience and we do not want that. So everyone gets enough attention for their work. So it's, it's a rough gauge, but usually artists understand that. They understand if the person is the last artist on the list, it would be great to have, support each, other's, um, each other by keeping it within the framework. So this is on the artistic level. Now on the social level, how APEL works. And this is equally important, actually. It works in tandem with the artistic level. And you will see they are all together. They are not one separated, separated from the other. In, um, first of all, in the artwork, they support one another, right? They, they do uh, outside eye, they, do, um, they give each other um, interviews, they help each other with material, helping each other sew costumes sometimes. You know, they until middle of night, three o'clock in the morning. Last edition, we had people, they, someone wanted to sew something and the team were helping her sew for like two, three o'clock in the morning. They really work together as a team. This is on the artistic side. But on the social side, on the on the day-to-day -day, uh, functioning side, they, they, they also organize their own uh, spaces, their rehearsal timing, the two, uh, who does what, who has time for what. They also do the cooking kitchen routine and they, uh, they clean together. They organize their meetings, their group meetings. They even have to organize the stage um, stage changing of scenes between each piece. There was no stage hand on in the theater, they, or at least we deliberately did not have stage hand. Um, partly also because of money, but in the, in the first year edition, that was not funded. They do their own change of scene by themselves. And then we kept it, even though now you're funded, we kept it because we think it's great because it, it creates a kind of a, a homogenous a group well, homogenous is a uh, stranger, but a team, it, it creates a team. They know each other's work very well. Um, then um, we talk about the place is uh, kind of a safe space for them. There was no, um, it, it's a place for Asian artists. So that creates also a very tight bonding for them. And also this idea of working together, getting to know one another, uh, creates the friendship, which is, I think is important uh, for solidarity. So usually after their uh, APAL experience, uh, each group actually becomes a, they form their own mini collective. They actually do their own things. Each one are uh, tightly linked to each other, the person. And they even have this um, crossover with, uh, with, uh, between different editions. They come to the performances, they start to have dialogue with the other artists from the other editions. So they kind of slowly create a network among themselves. They have been requesting me, can we connect me with the other artists over there? Because I see my theme 
is similar to the other person. So I connect them. So it becomes a connecting point between the artists from different editions. So as you can see, uh, for us, this idea of solidarity, networking, that was also one of the aim of APAL. It was not just the artistic level. It's this other part, this other social political part, which was the, the source or the motivation why we started APAL. Right, that there were too many artists working isolated. This network, this solidarity was what was the starting point. And that's why uh, APAL worked this way. It's working together. So uh, with that, I, uh, I guess any questions on this about, um, before we talk about translocality, maybe uh, any questions about how APAL worked, the basic structure, Hao Nian or? I think Jesus. no. I think for now, uh, it's it. The picture is becoming clearer, and it's great mm -hmm. that this is a good time to bring in uh, this underlying philosophy or underlying politics that you have, right? The trans locality or trans localism that you're going to talk about. So for me, I think you talked about April having this aesthetic, artistic, and then the social strand. But for me, I think there is also the third strand, which is the which sits right under these two, which is the translocality. So please uh, continue. Cool. Uh, yes, this translocality is something like you say, it's the undercurrent. It's not on the surface. You don't see it because, but it is because uh, maybe uh, just a little bit what interests me. I came to these terms, uh, this term actually itself, like maybe eight, nine years ago. Uh, and I realized it came from uh, the studies of migrant, the current uh, migrant and refugee studies. Um, it, it came from this idea that uh, before, uh, in, the, in the earlier uh, 19th century, 20th century, when we talk about migration, people, the idea was to uproot yourself and plant a new route and become, you know, integrate, assimilate into the new cu culture, a new place. Uh, in recent uh, migrant studies or refugee studies, it has shown that we don't do that anymore. We, and because of internet, because of uh, cheap traveling, we always keep our root of, to the, our connection with the, our place of origin and the place of destination. There are always these two places. We, we alternate between two origin, the two centers, and that uh, we, are, we are multiple centered people. Our identity are not just uh, truncated. We actually continue growing our root with the, uh, our center of origin and our center of a new destination. And so this is what interests me. And then when I was introduced this, uh, to this term, and then when I look at APAL, this is what happens is that APAL, all the artists are translocal. <laughs> I mean, literally, you're right. Uh, they all either come from another country or they are first generation German, uh, Asian German. German, Asian, Asian, German. So they have always this other, other center it's, that's pulling them. There's always a tension, a dialogue, a tension, a, a negotiation, or however, however you want to call that. So this is important, this little tension between two places. So, and that these two places, these two identity are merged into one person and they are equally important. They are not like one more important than the other. They are equally important and they're in dialogue. And this is what makes... Uh, translocalism so interesting is that at least for a choreographer the idea that you can be rooted and at the same time mobile the mobility and rootedness or groundedness doesn't have to be uh, exclusive they can be together and that was a new concept that I really uh, uh, loved and also speak to my experience as a uh, Asian person living in Europe uh, that I am translocal and then seeing it projected into a larger space where the artists come together and they, 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 that's what I'm saying. When they come together, there was no need to explain, actually. They understood this. Even without explaining it, they were, exp they were expressing themselves in the very translocal um, terms, very in uh, uh, instinctively. And it's very interesting how they negotiate two different cultures or three different cultures at the same time. And all of them were doing it all the time. So that was very interesting. And, uh, and also the interesting thing for the artists is that they move, when you talk about translocal, at least in APEL, we move beyond the identity uh, of nas national, national identity. So nobody, nobody's concerned whether you are German or you're not German. This idea of if you're, if you're in Germany, you talk about German themes. Nobody talks about, nobody, the, the topic of identity uh, through the lens of nationality was a kind of, uh, was bypassed. They talk about being local. I come from Berlin. I living in Kassel. You know, they, they, oh, I come from, the, they, they start to talk about localities 
And so that creates a point of uh, convergence for the artists, even though they come from different, they have actually different passports, but it, they create a sense of community and a sense of commonness because they talk about localities. And in the localities, they are equal. There's no someone saying, oh, I'm the citizen of Germany, so I have more right to say about, talk about this topic. There was no such thing. Everyone's talking on a very equal level. This idea of uh, bypassing this national identity, this national right to, <laughs> to certain topic or certain knowledge. There wasn't. There was a multiple centers of knowledge. And this is interesting. And obviously, uh, also very importantly, um, it opened them, especially for people coming outside Germany, it opened them to a new way of positioning themselves in relationship to their environment, which is German politics, German landscape, German culture. It create, they allow them to enter in not just as a foreigner, it allow them to enter in as a, you know, like they can be local and yet uh, without being a citizen, they can be local and talk about local topics. So it allowed them to enter into the environment very easily. And that was very interesting. So this is on the side of translocality, uh, how the artists uh, work. And on the, on the second level, it was on, uh, as you can see, the artists come to the farm and then they go to Berlin. So this translocality is again, not about national boundaries. It's also between the rural area and the city that we are move, moving the centers of art making from the city and transporting it backwards. So there's a moving forward and backwards. So while the presentation happens in Berliner Ring Theater, which is in Berlin, the whole process for the artist, actually the real process starts a uh, begin in on the farm. So when they think about, when they think about APEL and art making and the origin of their work, they didn't think of uh, Berlin as the source, they, actually, they would think back always to the farm, which is very interesting because it's where they built the bonding. The artwork was germinated there. So uh, that became a very interesting dialogue as well. The idea of art can be in, does it, to decentralize this concentration of power of art in the city, how do we move it outside? It is especially important in Germany because we do have right-wing tendency, right? <laughs> how to move the art? This is where the art must go into as well. How do we move it out into the rural area? Because this is where our most, most conservative uh, part of the society is situated at the moment. How do we not congregate ourselves and become a bubble? How can art, especially Asian artists, who it's easy to make Asian art, queer art in Berlin, but this is not, you're, you're, we're talking to the, the converted, you know, if you want to bring them, if you want to really, really uh, get an, it, I would say really, but get an impact or have a touch the edge of making art and they need to move out to the, to the, to the rural area. So this translocality is happening between city and rural area. And it is, it is still a new thing for us, for me at least. So I'm trying to figure it out as well. I must be honest. So it's not like I have a, a concept how it works. I'm still figuring out and smelling it how can that work? How can that be more strengthened? Uh, can, how can it be strengthened? Um, and last thing is, as well, in the translocality concept, um, because translocality works on process, obviously, it's about a process. It's not about the end point. It's, a pro it's, it's also a non-linear process, but it's also about community, working with community, which, whether it's the Asian artist that I'm talking about, it's a community, we need to listen to them, we need to understand them, but also the village as well the, the, that I'm in. I need to talk to my neighbors and Berliner Ring Theater, we need to talk to the, the, the all, it's all about com different communities. And the last thing is about um, place. This is about locality, right? It's a placing, finding place. It's, and it is very tangible. It's no longer an abstract concept. Place meaning where you stand, where you live, where you, function. So you need to, there's a relationship happening. This is all about relationship. So this is very important because it's based on all this. So when the pandemic comes, when I, we're working through translocality uh, principle, uh, we adapt very fast because we are listening to the community. We're responding to the place. We are using process. So while many international collaboration did collapse, we actually could readapt very quickly because we are on the ground. So this is uh, three things I myself discovered that was very interesting to work this way. It allows us to be very agile, very adaptable. And um, yeah, I want to pass it to Dana. Um, I would like to add on something also at this point as being um, mentioned about placing. And um, I would, would, what I would want to talk is that this, the meaning of this word placing do not 
always mean in this um, always mean like physically or geographically placing by like art migrants. Uh, at uh, art mi migrants, sorry, sometimes I just pronounce the word in a German way <laughs> without to notice it. As uh, art migrants, we might have three, like we might have relationships with three different societies. At first, the white society we are physically living in. Secondly, like the, the, the societies which we are grow up, and also the third one is the communities which we are living in in, in Germany. And these communities might be up by person who share the same, mm. uh, the similar um, experience. And for, for me, like to think about the local of the art means to redefine our relationship and also our responsibilities with the three different societies. And I think this kind of responsibilities, I actually, I think for me is identity, for me is the same, have the same meaning like response, responsible for one society. That's uh, how I'm going to understand my identity. And as an artist, usually we need to define our identity and also our responsibilities to decide which what we want to talk which kind of message we want to give and on which society we want to have our impact so this kind of to redefine our relationships not only with the white society also with the within the communities and with the the another society we, we are grows up actually give us also a source or recognitions of part of our identity and also like give us a motivation to doing some of the, our artwork so i think this kind of idea about translocalism is very also very central for the art migrants to doing art because in certain point of our um, work work progress we need to know that we are being seen as others in all of the three, my, all of these three contexts, we are seen as other in the white society. We experience a very strong self-othering process. We learn to see ourselves through the lens of the white society and knowing our identity in this society as majority, uh, as minorities. And also we are seen as a foreign in a I'm seeing as a foreign in a China in Chinese society because I don't live there, yeah. I don't work there, and also I might not know things so well or in the exactly the same way like the people who are living there. But like to redefine these trans localities is like to find out why this kind of distance, this distance with both society might be some productives, and also because of this kind of distance, we have the freedom or we have the opportunities to deal with certain topics. So that's why this local translocalism might for me also give me another concept about diaspora. I think uh, we all know that then now we have a lot of critical voices about this, uh, this, this concept diasporas because they always define one root and also seeing the diasporas like yes. people who spread from the roots and translocalism is like to give the artists the freedom to define, okay, I can put my emphasis by my own. I can choose to which kind of society I want to relate more without like to deny part of myself. Yes. Great. Thank you, Nantan, for uh, clarifying that. Uh, that's very interesting. And I think this is a very good time for me to invite Fiza to join in the fold uh, to give us uh, an idea of what she's, be, what she's thinking of when the two of you have been talking about this project that you're doing and to hear a bit from her. Fiza. Um, hi, oh my god, there was just so many things and I go like, oh, I experienced that too. Oh, that's what I wanted to do. Um, and so I just want to kind of maybe begin with, um, you know, about making spaces, your very first point about why you started APAL. Because for me, um, that was one of the main concerns. Uh, I kind of moved, I was a producer programmer with the Esplanade and now I'm with SIPA. But I have also have kind of, you know, things that I do on the side and working with, like, artists, uh, sorry, minority... Sorry, CIFA, as in Singapore, yeah, sorry, International, Singapore International Festival, Festival of, Arts. of Arts. You know, and, 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 I, and, I was, and I was thinking about, you know, 
because of my interest, I'm actually, maybe I FOMO a lot. I do not want to miss out on things. So I follow a lot of artists uh, who perhaps do theatre, not at the centre, not at city centre, not at your usual um, arts venues, um, but in the heartlands of Singapore. Uh, so they do either what you would call like more theatre for community. Um, and that for me has always been interesting to see who's doing what, what are people saying or what are they saying with their work um, and who's coming and who's watching. So that's me being like FOMO and busybody going around watching watching people and watching works, right? And I realised that, and as for me who program and produce or who used to program and produce, now still program, I don't know, I'm doing a lot of things. Uh, but, and I realised that when when programmers program, they do a lot of the same, they present the same artists over and over again. Um, and so for me, it gets it gets worrying. I guess it gets worrying for me because I believe that when we present art or when we program, we need to think about the diversity of voices. Um, and so for me, I go, who else? Um, so I'm always in the search for that, right? Uh, who else is not at the table? Who else should be, uh, should should, should we try to amplify and who should we try to support? Um, and so I guess this is where um, the two programs that, um, that I'm currently working and, and working on uh, that might be of interest and relevant to this discussion is first, a gale, uh, which is a uh, uh, gale means to kind of move your hip into gale. Um So we had uh, gale is started, was uh, kind of followed Joget, uh, which I started, uh, and Joget means to dance or a form of uh, of Malay dance um, that started that kind of a platform that I started in when I was in Esplanade um, to feature uh, dance artists, uh, Malay dance artists who um, are doing more contemporary expressions. So most of them kind of start from traditional Malay dance and then kind of moving into contemporary dance, and I wanted like. In Singapore, where Malay dance, when you think about Malay dance, it goes immediately to the traditional. Um, I thought like, well, where's the space for artists who want to try and do things differently and who wants to kind of experiment and explore? Um, and I knew of people or, or choreographers who are already doing, but never have the opportunity or space and resources um, to fully explore what they were doing. Or what they are doing. Um, and so Gaelic came two years after. Um, actually, it started from a sort of a, a round table discussion uh, where someone kind of put together, uh, wanted to talk about Malay dance in Singapore, uh, dance by Malay artists. Uh, but, on, but during that discussion, it, we had um, your traditional Malay dance gatekeepers, people who have the power to determine what's right, what's wrong, how things need to be, versus the young who are trying to kind of, I use very, like, very loosely, okay, the young who are trying to do things um, in their own terms, right? And in the discussion, it came, became really obvious that why are we, why are these young artists playing to the rules of, that it has no relevance to their work? Right, so then it became obvious that I said, hmm, maybe we need to kind of find space for this. Maybe we need to find a new field. Maybe we need to find our own rules. Maybe we need to find our own words or to articulate what is it that we're doing, so then people don't hijack or we don't have to be defined by someone else's definition of what Malay dance is. Um, so that's where Gede came because um, after Joget realized that there were actually more artists, uh, you know, uh, Prisma. Um, company started by um, Haizat, Hashima, Harith and Haris, uh, they became like sort of the beacon and the safe space for such an, art so such an artist who want to kind of work um, in contemporary expressions uh, but with Malay dance training, with Malay dance identity. Uh, and so we decided like, hey, there's, there's actually more who are coming forward and, and doing these things. So what can we do? What, what's lacking? What can we, how can we profile them? What needs to happen? Um, and so for Gaelic, I mean, we forget it, and also for later on, for me, I'll elaborate on Tuncho Ara Ia Kener, which is a a a a, 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 a capability program for Malay and Tamil theatre directors. Um, it was it kind of came because it came about because there's the 
a grant money, right? So <laughs> Singapore government is like, hey, we're giving money. Uh, you self-employed, you freelancers. Uh, you want to help yourself and get paid. Do projects. We'll support. And we decided we, we were going to take the opportunity. We were already in discussion. I was already thinking these things. And I said, hey, there's an opportunity here, right? Uh, the group of us came together to do this. Said, let's just, let's just do it. Let's see what can happen. Um, and so we decided to kind of forget it, to think about um, what are some of the things that, that is necessary, perhaps, in creating a work. Um, so I guess unlike uh, what you're experiencing, Nina and, and Dandan, uh, most of the artists or dance artists or theatre artists in Singapore that is of a, that occupies a, a, a specific a particular space um, don't are not really um, don't usually have formal training in the art form. Um, and so these most of the things that they do or they are, or how they create works are things that you know they pick up as they go about working on projects. Um, so artists may have a long years of experience, but um, in terms of like craftsmanship, there's it's a bit kind of loosey goosey sometimes, um, or in a sense of of thinking critically about what they're doing, it feels like that there's they come to a certain point and they kind of stop there. Um, and so we're thinking, could there be something else to uh, for us to do to unlock certain things, um, unlock in terms of critical thinking, unlock in terms of craft, unlock in terms of opportunities. Um, and so like you, in terms of um, how you think about um, societies and how you travel from the margins back to the centre, in Gele and in Tunjo Ara, Yakener, we also think about how after, with these artists, we can find opportunities for them after they have kind of come into this space. Uh, so, we, you know, for me, it's like, I talk to other producers. I talk to uh, programmers, uh, uh, venue programmers. I talk to festival uh, programmers, and we're like, "Hey, would you be interested? Could you come? You know, just just have let's just come in and uh, and have a chat. Find out what they're doing uh, because." Um, sometimes um, these artists just don't come, uh, or just don't. Um, they're not just not amplified, they're not seen, you know, just like your social media algorithm, you only see what you see, uh, <laughs> or you only see what you like. Uh, and so there was one of our ways to kind of break the algorithm and kind of push them to the fore. Um, there were also other kind of things that for us, I mean, in this part of the world, I will, um, let's say um, for Gaelic, for example, um, we were we were kind of insistent about having something at the end of the six months together. So the program has been designed in such a way that um, there's like a series of masterclasses or sharing by artists. Uh, so it goes from um, perform um, classes on performance making, classes on archiving, classes on, uh, because for Gilead, there's also, um, we were looking at querying bodies and looking at the identities, uh, uh, identity politics. So we had people to kind of talk about how that relates back to queer, what does queering mean in Southeast Asian or in Malay or in the Nusantara com, uh, context. So we really wanted, we didn't want to think about, oh, it's, it always has to be in a certain kind of methodology, but we wanted to bring it back uh, into the Malay archipelago and the traditions and the knowledge that comes from the Malay archipelago. Um, and so we were, we had, uh, we had Rianto coming in, looking at, you know, doing a, doing a couple of masterclasses. Uh, we had uh, Afian to come in and think about all the slangs of queer slangs um, um, or, or looking at cultural context. So it was, we felt like we needed that, you know, in order not just think about what, yeah, to think about where knowledge comes from and to, and to also, I guess, emphasize that even within the Malay archipelago, we have all these traditions and knowledge that we could kind of use in our work. Yeah, so that's that. <sighs> that's just one project. I'm really like breathless. But the second project that I have uh, that I'm still kind of going on um, is Tunjo Ara Yakuner. Again, um, this developmental program for Malay and Tamil theatre directors for me was something that as a programmer producer, you know, there's always like, oh, who else? Who else can can I commission? Because that's how Singapore works, right? You commission, you produce something, um, or because of, you know, you have more resources if you get uh, <laughs> if you get commissioned because there's money there. Um, but most of the time I find that 
there's a lack and there's also a dwindling of Malay and Tamil theatre the directors who are able to help commissions. And so you kind of see again the same names or you see opportunities given by to, to Chinese people, right? Or to people who are not Malay and who are not Tamil. So it is, it is also working with that, working that politics. Because for me, it's like um, what I've learned and what's coming out from this first round, because this program is also an experiment. Um, I, I got, so myself, um, and Edith Podesta um, created or designed the curriculum. It's really based on what I have seen, what my observation of uh, what Malay and Tamil theatre directors are doing, what maybe might need to kind of uh, go into their thinking and their creating. Um, and so when we were create, when we were doing it, um, and so there's okay, sorry. So the program has two layers. First layer, uh, again, the master classes and sharing. So I've managed to get like. Um, 17 theatre directors from Malaysia and Singapore um, and, 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 and theatre makers like designers to come in and talk about um, like what directing is to them, how to direct or specific aspect of directing um, and also in working collaboratively with uh, lighting and set designers and also in the different formats. And the second layer is actually mentor a mentorship by Edith Foresta. So Edith would come in because we've given the tools. Now, how can the tools be applied in their own um, in their own work, right? How do they kind of... Uh, so we wanted to personalize the experience for each of the directors. So there are eight directors in total. So then we realized that when we went into previews, like, yes, Edith is there to kind of help them with like using these tools but Edith can't, 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 can't understand the language can't understand the cultural context so that's when I come in and go hey you know there's all these other questions that we can ask through the language through um, uh, history through this identity through because and, and that for me was uh, something that I kind of took away uh, in terms of uh, this director's program yeah I don't know, I'm rambling right now, I feel, but please interject. <laughs> yeah. No, you're not rambling. There's a oh, lot okay. to unpack. Cool. I just wish that you would actually speak a little slower. Oh, I'm right? sorry. You're very excited. <laughs> it's good. It's, it's These two projects that you are talking to us about, mm. they are exciting and needful projects. Um, just want to give a bit of Context and Ming and Fiza, please help because we have Dandan who is new to the Southeast Asian scene, as it were, right? We're talking about Singapore with a population that is predominantly made up of Chinese, Malay, and Indian. And then there are the small little smattering of, of races. Um, do any of the, the, do Ming or Fiza, would you have sort of like a percentage breakdown of the population at the moment? What's the percentage of Chinese population in Singapore. The last time I read it was about 70%. Is that correct? Yeah, probably right. Yeah. And I think Malay <laughs> comes in at about 15, 1, 5, I think. Uh, oh, definitely below right. 20. <laughs> yeah. Right. So we're talking about that kind of a, 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 a population breakdown <laughs> where, you know, more than 70% made up of Chinese migrants who are into their fourth, fifth generation already. Mm -hmm. uh, and we had a very interesting conversation yesterday uh, among friends uh, at dinner where uh, there are so many of us who still believe that the, in terms of the governance of Singapore, it is based on communism. Uh, the governance of Singapore is based very much on the central uh, 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 governance of how China was run, except that now capitalism plays a huge part, right? But it is about a very authoritarian socialist approach where there is always the father, the father who is the one who is leading this country into success. And it has to be a very um, strict definition of how success is seen honestly, it was really just about economic success because Singapore is a small, tiny island with, what's the population at the moment? 26? Is, is that correct? Oh, there you go. The, the, the statistics are up. I was sort of quite... On oh, the well, 
So yeah, so we're like, talking about this kind of very good, of, very good. <laughs> we're talking about this kind of numbers where um, if you're going to be looking, oh, we're going at five point really only five point four five. Only. Yeah, quite a number of people left <laughs> Singapore because of COVID, but. <laughs> So we are talking about a society where everything else, if you're talking about cultural uh, and aesthetic production, uh, in terms of the kinds of, of diversity, the Malays and the Indians really are a very small number. And that's why they talk, that's why Fisa is talking about minority here. Whereas when you then switch it back over to Germany, you're talking about also a dominant society of Caucasian, which is what? 90% if not more and then if you are zooming in on even a minority Asian population that would probably be 1 or 2% right because these days I think especially in Europe migrant uh, communities especially in Germany the bigger ones would actually be from the Middle East uh, uh, and East European refugee communities if I'm not wrong right we're talking about Turkey Syria right so Asia represents a small part and i think if my history serves me well when we talk about the uh, mekong uh, wars vietnam and cambodia the refugees that went over to europe uh was very little or the numbers were small because when you look at cambodia and vietnam you're talking about mostly french influence also so they will go via france more than to germany and of course, then there was the US who came and then they went that way too. I think this is also very interesting to track. And that's how you see, uh, if you want to look at modern migration patterns, I think it's very uh, tacked on to the aesthetics and cultural uh, 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 movements also of how we go about organizing ourselves as, as communities and artists. I have a huge question for all three of you. And it's interesting because I think it was either Ming who brought up the idea of solidarities. We talked about solidarities in our last, in our pan panel yesterday also. And this idea of minorities, right? You have APEL, you have Tunjo Ara, you have Gele, who are quite specific in looking at certain cultural communities, right? For APEL, it's slightly larger because like you said, it's so hard to define Asia, but at the same time, there is a group there, right? So the idea is that to find these uh, minority voices, to express them in different ways. For FISA, specifically in Gaelic, you are also not looking at expressing uh, a minority cultural and aesthetic voice, but you're also trying to encourage the expression of a different generation of cultural and aesthetic expression, right? From the old guard, like you said. My question is then, and because APEL is more of, at the moment, a constant entity, I think it's great that you have these artists coming together to support each other. When does it become, or do you think they'll ever become where these kinds of minority support groups or artistic support groups, is there a danger of them actually ghettoizing themselves, where then it becomes an, an us-against-them thing, right? Yeah. So you get together... You talk about your politics, and yes, there is an affirmation of that politics, an affirmation of the identity, but is there a danger where you suddenly always will go, for lack of a better term, I'll say, inciting certain kinds of prejudice against the dominance also? Yeah. I think that's something that I have become very aware of uh, being actually BIPOC in Australia, where it's all right to find your own voice and identity, but I think the bigger problem is always that what happens when this minority voice starts to actually express resentment and anger and rejection towards the dominant community. For instance, APA coming together for seven weeks, you know, what happens in the most colloquial terms, what happens when these artists get into a bitch fest about why is it so hard uh, to live in Germany and why the bloody whatever, whatever, or the white societies, you know. Do you ever see a risk of that happening? This is a question for all three of you. And actually, I'd like to give a shout out to Frederica also. If you want to join in, uh, 
we'll find a way, yeah, Eugene. So, uh, Frederica, you just have to wave at us and we'll try and get you into the conversation. Yes, Tantan's hand is up. Please. It's okay when I like to so quickly try to give an answer of this question. Okay, um, I think one actually one very in, important aspect, which by community buildings, which uh, Ming and I I've, um, are following is self-critic. I think the self-critic is the primus of all the critic, which means um, also beyond be, beneath this minority communities, we need to have a very critical awareness about construction of the identities. We need to have a very uh, clear awareness about our the problems of our own traditions. When, I, when I'm allowed to use this word own tradition, and yes. also we need to be very clear aware Absolutely. about the power structure, the power structure beneath certain artist communities, Absolutely. which are very patriarchal and non-feministic. And also, as you mentioned, as very like uh, old fashioned family structures uh, in, in a lot of way. So I think at first, we, I, I think I want to emphasize it's legitimate when the minorities experience certain racism, they make, they articulate their anger and also to, to, uh, to um, work for their own right. But at the same way, Without this kind of self-critic, there is no true critic. It's my. It's also there is no true critic towards this kind of majority society. So it's not. I'll. I'll, I'll even then add on Dandan to say that uh, what you're looking at is not just the term self-critique, but rather to have a real uh, sense of reflexivity, right? Uh, which is a, a, the a more like critical term, actually. Yeah, which which actually is. It is to politicize one's own view, but also to critique it, right? Ming. This is where also what Dainam brought up, which also I find important, is to be aware of the power structure, power dimension, right? Power dimension, power relationship. Meaning we always say that we are the minority, we are minority. This is always, of course, that's why I say in APEL, we do not see ourselves as minority, number one. <laughs> you know, uh, So APEL, one of the rules is that when you come into the safe space, you're no longer minority, you speak. And when you speak through that lens, you're not speaking to a victim lens. You have to be very empowered lens and you say, therefore, you become very critical. You say, if I have the power to say what I want to say, then you, you're no longer able to play the card of I'm the victim anymore. So we become very critical of each other. That's why it's very important in the APEL there should not be a white person there because then we play the dimension changes. Once we say we are Asian, now we can critique you because I have a right to critique that you are now playing victim card. I'm sorry. Because I'm we are all in the same group now. So we self-check one another, each other's power that Got relationship, it. we cannot play the idea that we are all victim because it's, there's because we are all in the same group now. And Danda comes in as a dramaturg. She brings in the perspective of self reflection. That's her job as a dramaturg to be very critical about the artist relationship. But also within our relationship, in APEL, we become very aware of a power relationship because none of us are coming from a standard Asianness. Some German Asian, some Asian from Asia, some people are me who is colonized Asian. So we come and say, hey, your perspective. So the diversity is important now here. So the, the idea, understanding we, we all situate ourselves in different power structures and that your power structure may be different, but I can critique your idea of uh, victimization. I say, sorry, but for me, from my perspective, it's not the same. So this diversity is very important. Also the selection of the artists, therefore very important. So every group where we select, we select a group of artists that can have a conversation. That's why the selection is an important process. So the curation between me and Federica is part of this, selecting the grouping. Because we don't want to kind of like beach party, like you say, come in and all beach about things. You know, this is where there's no... So the curation becomes important here. It, it comes into play. Yeah? Pisa? Um, I think for Gile, it came out of a beaching party. Um, <laughs> so it was, we go like, okay, we're tired of beaching, we're tired of renting. Can we do something about it? Okay. What can we do? How can we change the rules? But actually, within Singapore, for me, unfortunately, I, I think we still need to kind of say these are minority artists. We, I still need to, we still need to use the label of Malay and Tamil, etc. Um, Indian, however it is, the, the identity needs still need to be kind of attached, mainly because 
if not, you can't see, you don't see Malay and Tamil, you know. And the thing is, at this moment, it is important to say there are differences between us. We are not all on equal playing field. And to kind of, by naming, I feel like I'm highlighting the differences and I'm going, there's a gap here or there's a potential here that we can grow and we can help support and amplify. Um, so I had that critique in 2018 when I first started Joget. It was like, oh, aren't you ghettoizing this artist? Why is it necessary? But the language that also comes out artistically from the artist, you go like, oh, I've never seen that before. Where did that mm. come from? It came from a Malay tradition, you know? Um, and so I think... At this point, now, in 2022, I think I still need to use uh, those labels. Until that's why for me, it's like, even when I'm thinking and conceptualizing Tunjo Ara, I did say, I wish in future, I do not need to use these labels anymore. Um, and that we can go past because everyone's kind of have got the same resources. Because at this point, you know, Malay and Tamil artists are still not getting paid equitably you know in Singapore so I think that needs to be highlighted I don't think there's a the, a question about the labeling the, the categorization I think it's what Ming said also it's about uh, reprising the victim's role basically right uh, the the reinforcement of the minority category I think is very important because it is like representation, if we don't keep, if we keep, keep not seeing BIPOC people on stage, uh, BIPOC colours, uh, BIPOC representation on stage, then it just perpetuates itself. But the thing is then, like you said, it's about, uh, it's a, for, for Ming, it's about not playing the victim card anymore and to say, yeah, we've got to really get out of that and have an expression that might be political and mostly it is, but there is also the coming together to actually express a different kind of artistic uh, uh, dimension, right? Uh, but I think in Singapore, the categories, unfortunately, are very important. Yeah. Ming? I also want to say that uh, the situation in Singapore is different from what we have in Germany. The, the ecology is different, right? The, the constellation of artists are different. The Malay, Malay artists, has, you have a constant, like the hundred years in Singapore. Uh, we're not talking about the, the founding of uh, the government, but the idea of Singapore being longer than the Singapore government. Uh, the, the idea that, uh, that the, the Malays have been subjugated to a certain power structure for a long time consistently, right? Now, where, where we are at in, in APEL, which is different, me, me I, I, I migrate here 30 years ago in Europe, not Germany, but and then I came here 10 years ago, done, done as well. So we all came here new. We're looking at, we, we are attacking the power structure it, with our capacity because we hold tools. But I think the Malays in Singapore has been uh, deprived of those tools consistently and systematically for too long, which means you need a different tool. So I'm not saying you're wrong. Actually, maybe you're right. If I'm in Singapore, I would do the same thing because what, what you need, you yeah. need different things now. You need a different process. You're a different stage. We, I, I come in with the tools already. I'm like, no, I don't need this tool. I don't need the tool of what you do, you Mal Malays need in Singapore because I have, I have tools. I know I can attack this system in a different way. You have only certain limited tools, which you therefore, one of them is pitching party, <laughs> which I think is not a problem. It can be a tool. It's a tool where we come and put our grievance, uh, grievance together and see what the, this, uh, the injustice are. I think this is important to acknowledge and hold space for the injustice and to say this is it and, and not to let it go away, not to let not to let it go away and not to forget it. I think this is not 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 to be discounted. This this importance, it is very important, right? But I don't have grievance with the German society <clears throat> systematically for the last two generations. I just came here. So there is a difference in uh, dynamics and ecology. And I think this is why I think our strategies are slightly different and our needs are slightly different. And I think it's all, all correct. It's just we are reflecting to our, uh, we are related, uh, responding to our context, actually. Um, okay, one last uh, comment from Dandan. And I just want to quickly flag up now that uh, for those of you who are tuning in, please feel free to also ask questions and give us comments if you want to. Uh, just raise your hand and I'm sure uh, someone will unmute you or maybe you you unmute yourself. But yeah, we're now going to a second, to the last part of it where we welcome feedback and questions. Dan Dan. 
thank you for, for the opportunities. And I'm going to make my words very short. I think by this uh, political aspect of building communities, uh, one thing is very important is that do not assume that because you, you share the same geographic or cultural background, you have consensus about political issue. There is no consensus just because we are all Chinese or we are all Asian. And also inside of this community, you need always give space for negotiations about is there real any political same interest be, between you and if you go, if you let this process start, if you really talk, discuss, and try to find a aesthetically or political consensus, and then I don't think there is a, this kind of risk to get a, to build a homogeneous communities against the minor uh, majorities because actually, <laughs> Ming also want to add, add on something because this process of the negotiation itself is democratically for me. I add on, so this is how APAL works, right? So we do not try to have consensus. That means everyone is self-organizing. So they have to negotiate. So we actually, uh, that, like for example, as an organizer, we don't tell them what is the consensus. There's a framework and you can do whatever you want. So the idea is that we don't direct the conversation at all. And I think that's why I think APAL was a, very, a space where all the artists, they can have conflicts even and differences. And I thought that was the great part about it that, that builds the solidarity stronger because they knew that they were all very different even though they share similar experiences but the the, the solution to those problems each one handled it differently and they, that was the best part about especially during dinner time we can see that you know people talking about how they deal with it and everyone is different it's really nice to see this um, diverse of political stance even as minorities thank you um Fiza would you is there any comment that you would like to take through to to Tandan and, and uh, Ming? No, I think, I mean, I just do not want to kind of play to the, I think for both of the programs, it's really to kind of create our own rules and to create the kind of circumstances that we want to, what is the ideal for us to grow as artists, as a minority artists in Singapore? Tamil because you know even like what you're saying right even within one identity there's so many differences so for me like in in in, in trying to or in conceptualizing Tunjo Ara I was very ideal I mean this is really a draft one of my program right I go okay we go with Malay and Indian theatre directors then after that I sit down again I go like Indian but who what language what culture what you know and then for even for Malay I go like who, what kind of Malay because the class of Malay is also very different. So does that matter? Does that not matter? Um, do I need to introduce language here? Do I not need to introduce language? So all these kind of negotiations even. Um, and I didn't want to kind of, in a way, play against someone. Um, so it was really just, okay, now what resources do I need to, to provide or to help, you know, to support these artists? So in a sense that whether it is... Um, Oh, there's any kind of um, antagonism or uh, with majority, minority, I feel like um, we're kind of more focused on how do we develop ourselves um, in these programs and then what is our politics, what do we want to say um, and how do we say that best um, and so that is also, that is what uh, in both programs we're trying to support the artists with. Thanks, Fiza. I'm just going to read out a uh... Uh, what Federica has put up on the chat, right? Uh, she says, quote, For me, it is very important to be aware of the German white dominant society during our work in APEL. Though I totally agree with Ming, we don't play the victim card within APEL. We are indeed so different, and this difference could be discussed in APEL. Still, it depends on the artist, but we don't want to, but we don't want to all right, and we don't want to. The motto is, do what you always want to do. So in that sense, I guess for artists coming to APEL for residency, there is really a need to generate something in them already. Uh, yeah, uh, obviously with some kind of, um, I won't want to use the word advice. I don't even want to use the word mentorship. Uh, more the fact that there might be some help in terms of dramaturgy, if you like, yeah, uh, and uh, um, 
yeah, and someone who is there to drill in this thing about reflexivity, right? Uh, so that's that's important, I think. Um, whereas in FISA's programs, I think, yeah, there is a certain kind of structuredness which is probably needed, right? Because we are talking about younger artists, I would say, who could not get into the main, could not infiltrate the, 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 the main system, right? The dominant system or the, or, or the, the mainstream system, actually. Um, just across the board from uh, Ming, Tandan and Fiza, the artists whom you guys work with, whether it's APEL, whether it's uh, Gaelic, whether it's uh, Tunjo Ara, what are the age groups we're looking at and would they all usually be considered young or entry point artists or artists in their mid careers perhaps where would you literally place these artists in we their have, trajectory um, sorry so for gilly we have quite young um artists so they are mainly below 30 years old um they're kind of already i mean graduated or just graduated or have been working informally um in dance uh, so they do more of like tertiary uh, dance groups choreographing for uh singapore youth festival dance and things like that um i like so, the way I mean, you made a face when you said that <laughs> sorry <laughs> And then there are also, uh, for Tuncho Ara, it's actually different. Uh, you actually, we have up to about 40. Um, and I think our youngest is about 23, 22, thereabouts. Um, and I guess the kind of range is because some of the older artists have been working in, the, in between um, amateur and professional theater. So there's that line that they've been working at and that, um, uh, uh, so that's been interesting also to observe uh, what they're interested in. And, and I think for Tunjo Ara, we were able to kind of reach out to quite a number of such directors. Yeah, because that was that was the interest to kind of bring out other voices. Yeah. And for APEL, uh, because of the structure, because of the time, like 12 minutes and uh, seven days, uh, obviously it attracts only certain kind of artists. Uh, and also, we are, we are looking for experimentation, ideas, you know, ideas. So uh, the age range usually are more the young, uh, between like twenty something to about I think forty, the oldest probably, and usually uh, starting out or artists experimentation with experimentation. So younger artists trying to find their voices, or until uh, uh, artists who want to have a little switch over, like experiment a different a different color, different uh, aspect of their uh, work. Um, so uh, yes, so mid mid career young artists starting out artists yes, this is the, usually the range also because of the way we frame it. There's only certain artists would apply anyway, right? Yeah. And we're talking about diversity of uh, artistic fields, right? From dance to theater to whichever, because that's yeah. the politics or that's the the the. The, the the kind of uh, underlying philosophy that you have that, that is uh, any field of arts. Am I correct? Any field performing arts, anything performing arts. Sorry. So uh, the last one we had a sound designer. So we were wondering how can a sound designer do performing art, but she did it. So it's as long as she, they can define themselves uh, within the performing arts genre, it can be anyone. It can be mixed genre as well. It can be cross. It can be experimental. It can be as long as the artist can define it themselves, what that is, why is that performance? Mm -hmm. I think we do not try to define that for them. I think this is the important right. part for us. Why don't you go ahead and share with us some of the visuals if you want to. We can still continue talking while you share the visuals. Yeah, Dan, Dan do you, is there anything you want to add to what uh, Ming has been talking about? My other question would be then in terms of longevity for all of you actually, uh, longevity and sustainability of your programs, right? Um, where do you see APEL going? I, I guess the, the, the exciting thing is that you finally got official funding, right? Which means that there is some sort of a consistency and sustainable uh, 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 rolling out of the program. But more than that, do you think that you would actually want to have a longer kind of residency and develop it to a different degree? And for FISA, the question would of course be then, Gaelic now going into Tunjo Ara, especially with Tunjo Ara, is are you taking on another Tunjo Ara or 
are these uh, budding play, uh, directors from Tunju Ara then uh, going to be guided into a next phase of their career also? Maybe we well, hear from Ming and Dandan first and then Fiza. Oh, I thought Fiza can go. I, I, I don't mind. Okay, let's let's go. Um, <laughs> Sorry, Ming, your picture's very fast, Lee. <laughs> oh, okay. Very fast. Is it? Because you were speaking. That's why. That's we fine. Were... I can still speak. It's fine. People Fiza can, was okay, right? You know? Fiza was for you, right? Because you had time to look at it. Yeah, see? No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I can say it to you Slow privately. Slow book. <laughs> exactly. Too late. It's gone. The board is part, uh, gone. The sale. Anyway. Right. Uh, yeah. So, uh, where do we go? Yes, uh, funding. Uh, still, it's very important. It's about the solidarity. So, one of the key things that we have is that we cannot always depend on funding. We always think our baseline is that it's always self-organized. We have to keep this idea that we always must learn to self-organize because uh, a program like that, uh, always depending on funding, means puts the program at danger, meaning we always must be self-sufficient. That means community always is, comes first. How to build community always. not So that we do not use funding as a reason to build community. We build community and if money comes, everyone benefits. If not, we will benefit in other ways. So our baseline of APAL starts to, that, that we work with our funding and uh, funding comes great we spread out but if not we continue we do not let funding be the defining factor for doing apel so always the sort of community must always work uh come first so this is how we work so does uh funding change something yes it does allow us to for example the next edition we will have uh empowerment, empowerment workshop for the artists so they can there will be a an, an, an ex apel uh, artist who will come and so we also work within ourselves we we get artists who are uh, empowerment uh, facilitator to come and give uh, workshops as well so we we always work within ourselves also uh, one of the artists will be now our technical director as well for this this edition so we work within ourselves to learn to connect to to share resources so how to commute how to make sure that we as a community even without funding we will help each other we will collaborate even within each other so we do not need to have to go outside all the time to find your source within yourself so this is how it works. So does funding change? Yes, uh, but it doesn't. It will come and it will go. I just want to be honest about, uh, about funding. We are not unrealistic about it, but we do not let that be the defining factor of how we work. But APEL will go on. It will change. We will listen. We will readapt because we work translocal. We do not use the funding as our uh, mark, the, the mark of how we make APEL's program. It's, it's a community that make the APEL. So there are artists who come up now who they want to do new programming. They want to curate new ideas. So I said, let's do it. Let's do it. Also think about it, but don't think about the money first. Think of how we want to do it and why is it important for us. And so that's why APEL now uh, have a new, we, have, we split APEL. The residency now is called Amnesia. If you go to the website, you see it's called Amnesia now because yep. we have different programs coming up now because artists are, are proposing other things and so mm. they so I put the residency as amnesia but the artist was reorgan, self-organized other programs now which are going to be created by other artists within APEL so it's always self-organization that comes first it's the number one thing they must be motivated to do so it's no longer curated by Ming Poon or Federica Tsai or Dana it's from the artists themselves self-initiation this is how it works for us this is principle thank you Nandan, anything to add? Um, I think uh, I would like to add on as an uh, outside, outside person because I'm not the organizer of APO, mm, but I definitely yes. see the potential of APO to growing up, becoming a platform which also holding comfort, international conferences, hold workshops and festivals, like to build up a South to South uh, cooperation or East to East cooperations platform to showing contemporary um, Asian, the art from how to say, from the, the contemporary performing art from the Asian artist without emerging in such a kind of white and European centric institutions. That's my wish <laughs> for APAL. Thank you. Fiza. Well, I think one of the things that um, I actually didn't manage to do successfully for uh, Tunjo Ara is actually the sense of community, the social bit that APEL had. Um, and for me, I think really this was, a, I mean, I was working on it on a very short, tight deadline to kind of meet certain, you know, funding and all. Um, but I have been thinking, I mean, 
it has been sitting with me on what to do with Tunjo Ara after. Um, because in Singapore, there isn't a directing school or there isn't an art school that's really very affordable. Um, so how can I kind garner the support of our already practicing directors and to kind of give back in that sense uh, because I was actually one of the things that really surprised me was the generosity of um, each of the directors and and, and um, art makers that I've invited uh, to kind of share their experience give a lecture give, or give a workshop um, and I was really moved by that um, how the community came together and I think there isn't um, the lack of the desire to share or to see how they can give a helping hand. Um, so for me, I have been thinking about, do I think of Tunjo Aira in the sense that uh, there's a, like almost like a school, <laughs> a directing school, uh, but do I want to set up a school? Does it, do I really need to, what kind of resources need to go through that, uh, go into that? Um, and so I was thinking, I mean, for Tunjo Aira, uh, the first part, uh, there are two parts to it, right? The first part um, is the masterclass and the sort of the mentoring. And there's also the presentation, which I've been kind of busy with the past, uh, for the past couple of weeks and into next week. Um, and the first part is actually supported by National Arts Council with the self-employed uh, persons grant. But the second part is actually supported by Centre 42 and Ikamatra. Uh, I didn't manage to get sort of like, you know, national government funding for that. But I was very, you know, I was very again moved by Centre 42 and Ikamatra stepping up and saying, hey, we believe in, in this program. We see the need for it. Um, therefore, you know, we want to kind of put in money and put in resources with you. So it's also partly self self-produced in a sense. Um, and for me, I'm kind of also thinking because I don't think that projects like this should be in should be isolated, should be on its own, and it should be so insular. Um, I'm thinking: Do I make connections with IKI? Do I make connections with LaSalle? Do I make connections with like other theater companies who have the same kind of interest and and who see the need for for um, Malay Tamil theater directors right now? Um, so that's that, right? So that's for Tunjo Ara. So I have all these questions that I'm still kind of sitting on. Uh, for Gile, it has been, I mean, as of end of March, uh, the funding ends end of March. Uh, we've really kind of got support from um, Esplanade to support the work in progress sharing. So we are actually presenting six works or six work in progress. Um, and we have also kind of received interest from other organizations to kind of think about commissioning some of the pieces so these are the, the, why i shared earlier like we're trying to make these connections and finding opportunities for 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 dancers and these new works to be seen to have a life after um and then also to think about how can we because um actually the, the organizing team is made up of myself shaif fubahri uh dr amin farid um, and the folks from prisma uh hashima haris and haizat um, we're also thinking, how do we want to take this on ourselves? Because some of us are producers, uh, you know, Pris does anything want to be uh, place or program under uh, Prismas, perhaps they're yeah, their programming for the year or their season. So we're also thinking just not only for organization, but also how we who have kind of kickstarted this program support these artists because we, I mean, we have been working with them. We believe in their work. We believe in what they do. We want to see them, you know, kind of take on bigger stages and grow that for them, uh, mm. with them. Um, so, yeah, so that's the commitment. Sorry, I kind of went a bit long. <laughs> no, no problem at all. Um, on that note, I want to again express my thanks to Ming, Tan Tan and Fiza for being uh, with us on this uh, roundtable slash panel. Um, I think it's time to call it a day uh, for Singapore for FISA I think it's almost time for what is it now it's three it's five o'clock right a nap a nap, a nap. <laughs> whereas Ming and Dana are just beginning their day uh, thank you again for taking this uh, time out in the early morning yeah to be with us um, so we're gonna wrap here but before we go I just want to flag up a few things that's uh, been happening to us in ADN with Centre 42. This year, starting last year, has been a very busy year also in terms of not just the speaking, discussing, discourse part, but a lot of it also was about publications. We put out three uh, what we call e-zines, called the ADN Review e-zines, Volume 1, 2 and 3. And these are actually a collection of writings uh, and um, transcriptions based on all our activities in the past. Uh, it might be something of interest to Tandan, 
uh, to look at these uh, e-zines on PDF format that you can download from our website. Um, and we also then, uh, from these e-zines, generated uh, online discussion panels uh, based on uh, symposiums, conferences and of the past. That's one. And then the other one that I want to just flag up to people who have been part of our ADN ongoing activities, there is a little fun thing where please contribute to our ongoing mapping of dramaturgs and artists and performance makers around the world, yeah? So please put a pin on where you're from and where you might be from or where you're originally from or where you are now uh, to help us make this uh, map grow. On that note, I think I'm ready to say good day, good evening, good afternoon, <laughs> good night to all of you. Thank you so much again for being part of the, this uh, quite insightful roundtable. Thank you and good night. Thank you. Have a nice evening, morning, afternoon. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you for coming. Bye-bye.